welcome everyone to ASAN's 2023 Gala and Celebration of Self-Advocacy. This year's theme is We Weave Our Own Story, a tribute to the ways in which we all build networks of support for our communities. Every patch, every thread, and every bit of work makes a quilt stronger, and our community is strongest when we support and care for each other too. We are here to celebrate the work of self-advocates, of disabled activists, of our communities and our movements. We continue to gather virtually to keep each other safe in what many consider a post-COVID world, and we're grateful that it means we can gather with even more of our community. This evening, we are gathered to honor, celebrate, and uplift one another and honor the hard work done over the last year, and for many of our awardees, much longer than that. Thank you for joining us. I want to thank all of our sponsors this year. Our gold sponsors, ICDL and Verizon, and our silver and bronze sponsors, who you can see on the screen now, as well as all of the other sponsors you can find listed in this year's program. Your generous support truly makes a difference for ASAN. This year's theme, We Weave Our Own Story, reflects the interwovenness of our community and the work we do. We have fought alongside our grassroots this year against inaccessible health care that does not value people with disabilities, unfair pay, the lifting of vital protections around COVID-19, and so much more. But together, we have also made progress in research, in the fight for accessible health care, and in community living. We'd encourage everyone to check out our 2023 annual report, which is available on our website right now to learn more about the work we've been up to this last year. You can also follow along with our gala events and share your own experiences and thoughts for our celebration with the hashtag ASANGala on social media. It's now my pleasure to introduce ASAN's Executive Director, Julia Bascom. Hello and welcome everyone. I'm Julia Bascom and I'm the outgoing Executive Director here at ASAN. Thank you all so much for joining me today as we celebrate self-advocacy and reflect on what our community needs in these turbulent times. This is our fourth year of holding our annual gala virtually and I'm so grateful for everyone who continues to show up and help us celebrate safely. Before we get started, I wanna thank a few people. Thank you to the ASAN staff without whom ASAN simply would not exist. Thank you to our sponsors for their continued support and for helping us prioritize safety and collective access as the pandemic continues to unfold. Thank you to our panelists for sharing their time and their wisdom with us, and thank you to our awardees for their incredible work. And thank you to you for joining us online and celebrating with us. ASAN wouldn't be here doing this work without you. We need all of you as self-advocates and as allies with us in this fight to build a better future for our community. It has been the honor of my life to have spent the last 12 years working for ASAN and the last seven working as our executive director. With your help, we have fought and won numerous policy battles and worked to make the disability community a political force to be reckoned with. In 2017, ASAN and the broader disability community helped save the Affordable Care Act and Medicaid. I still can't believe that we did that. It wasn't supposed to be possible and we were just getting started. We have made community living a priority, fighting for the HCBS settings rule and control over our own services. In 2019, we made sure that any proposal for universal health care moving forward would include HCBS, and we've helped craft legislation to improve and expand those services like the HCBS Access Act. We've worked to address the systemic issues with our criminal legal system, including addressing police violence, structural racism, and the school to prison pipeline. In 2019, when the government released a draft rule of the public charge rule that would prevent many immigrants with, a, with disabilities from obtaining legal status in the US, we submitted public comments opposing that rule. And in 2022, when the final much revised rule was issued, many of those provisions we fought against had been removed. In 2021, ASAN, along with COPA, Communication First, and Impacted Families, secured a tremendous victory after challenging the Fairfax County Public Schools' use of restraint and seclusion, paving the way for more challenges against seclusion and restraint throughout the U.S. 
we fought healthcare discrimination during the COVID-19 pandemic, and we're pushing for those protections to be enshrined now in the updated 504 regulations. We've continued to fight to stop the shock, and we've called on the FDA to reissue that 2019 ban as swiftly as possible. With Communication First and our allies, we helped develop the Accent Act to expand access to AAC and effective communication for all, and now we're calling on Congress to pass it. And when the Supreme Court threatened bodily autonomy and self-determination for everyone in the Dobbs decision last year, we helped lead that, commu that disability community response. I'm especially proud of the work that ASAN has done to make policy advocacy accessible to as many self-advocates as possible. In the last seven years, ASAN has released over 20 easy read, easy read resources on the issues that affect us, like community living, racial justice, and more. We've continually worked to improve our easy read skills, and we've trained other disability organizations on how to do the same. Since 2020, we began translating, um, sorry, since 2020, we've released over 53 resources about COVID-19 in accessible formats, including easy read and plain language and videos. In 2020, we began translating some of our resources into Spanish. In 2023, we released Bienvenidos a la Comunidad Autista, the Spanish translation of our 2020 resource, Welcome to the Autistic Community. In 2019, we unveiled our proxy calling system which enables people who can't use a telephone to still make calls to their elected representatives about the issues we're fighting for. And in the last seven years, ASN has trained 124 advocates through our Autism Campus Inclusion, or ECI, Summer Leadership Academy. And that's 206 total since the first training in, 200, in, 200, in 2012, which I remember well. For the last seven years, and since ASN was founded, we have fought to make the phrase, all means all, a reality. We fought to include all our community members, including those with the most significant support needs, in the policies and the programs that matter to our community. We have countered constant attempts to bring back functioning labels, institutions, sheltered workshops, and disability segregation. We've provided guidance on what ethical autism therapies look like and what genetic research should and should not be done about autism. Day in and day out, we tell policymakers that nothing about us without us isn't an impossible ideal, but rather it's the minimum our community deserves. And we tell them that disability rights, neurodiversity, and autism acceptance are for all autistic people. And we still have a long way to go. But when the White House Domestic Policy Council held two roundtable discussions on autism policy last year for Autism Acceptance Month, for the first time ever, the majority of the non-government attendees were self-advocates. So I am overwhelmed and humbled by the progress that we've made in the last seven years, even as we've been countering and um, contending with a global pandemic and many political leaders who are actively hostile to disability rights or sometimes just the concept of human rights at all. But I've also learned over and over again that in advocacy our success is often measured most of all by what didn't happen. We stopped Congress from dismantling the Affordable Care Act and Medicaid and then we also fought back administrative actions to impose work requirements across Medicaid, weaken labor rights for support workers, completely roll back the settings rule, and a lot of other stuff that I'm not supposed to talk about publicly. We've countered numerous attacks on the ADA from Congress and the Supreme Court, and we've successfully challenged pandemic triage guidelines in different states that instructed doctors not to save people with disabilities. Over and over again, we've fought to get bad policy that would harm people with disabilities out of gun safety legislation, we've kept bills to strip our community's rights from passing, and we've shut down attempts to make it easier to institutionalize us. We've worked with reporters and helped them tell stories that are more accurate and less stigmatizing. We've built coalitions across movements and helped groups from outside the disability community fix policy proposals until they no longer inadvertently excluded disabled people. And when supporters of things like sheltered workshops, institutions, and segregated services have tried to sway congressional offices, and they do every day, we've made sure those offices heard the facts. For the last 12 years, 
I've struggled to describe those kinds of victories to people, even though this basic defensive work is unfortunately the majority of what ASAN has to spend our time doing. This bad thing was going to happen and then it didn't is hard to get people excited about, especially when the bad thing was just the first domino in a long sequence that could have really harmed our community, but it wasn't on anybody's radar yet. This bad thing happened, but it could have been even worse, <laughs> is even harder. Harm reduction is essential, but it isn't sexy. And it's exhausting and humbling to know that, you know, more than 30 years after the ADA, after almost 50 years of the IDEA, more than 50 years after the deinstitutionalization movement took off, we're still fighting to defend those fragile inches of progress. What we have is not enough. We are fighting to gain ground, yes, but also just not to lose it. And what we have is so insultingly insufficient, so vastly inadequate to meet our community's needs and to just honor our basic human rights. And it could all go away in an instant. There is another court case coming up to, to completely defang, defang the ADA this term. The system that supports some, but not nearly enough people with disabilities to live at home has just imploded. Basic civil rights laws and decades of constitutional precedent are crumbling as we speak. So it's a hard time to do this work and it's gonna be hard for a long time. But there is honor in this work too. We are fighting to keep the laws and protections that members of our community have fought and crawled and died for. And we're not gonna let their sacrifices be in vain. We worked hard for laws like the ADA, the ACA, Medicaid, we fought hard to ensure that self-advocates have a voice in government. We're keeping those things, thank you very much. A life's work of just defending those gains against ceaseless attacks would be enough. It would be a privilege. The generation before me closed my state's major institution and made sure I could grow up at home. I want to push our freedom further but if I'm going to be forced to spend my time fighting just to make sure that the next generation can grow up at home too, I'll fight that fight. What an honor. Even when we can push change forward, you know, the truth is that policy change is often slow and incremental. It is a marathon, not a sprint, and the revolution will not happen overnight. Change happens in small steps that are always inadequate and never enough. Landmark laws like the ADA and the Affordable Care Act take years, often decades, to pass, and then they still leave critical issues unaddressed. There's always more work to be done. And we can do better, we must do better, and we can never let ourselves be content until everybody is free. But that doesn't mean that those small steps aren't worth fighting for. The current waiver system we rely on, I think, is a good example. This supports folks to live in the community. It is flawed. It is inadequate. It's badly under-resourced. Millions of us go without what we need. We desperately need to advocate for universal access to robust, self-directed support. But that doesn't make the waiver system worthless. To the millions of people who are relying on it today to stay out of institutions, you know, it means a great deal. And that matters too. What I'm trying to say is whether the fight is a glorious struggle for liberation or the long, slow slog of harm reduction and basic defense, we have to show up. Nothing is ever given to us. We have to fight for every inch of progress, every policy win, every little change. Even when we don't win. Even when the best we can say is that nothing happened. 
even when it feels like we are stuck in place. But we have to show up. Our community is worth it. We are worth it. And if we don't show up, the other side will be more than happy to work for as long as it takes to turn back time. We've seen that they are more than willing to do that, to spend decades and decades slowly building power and lining up dominoes until they hit a critical mass and they can just strip away rights that we assumed were bedrock. So we have to show up. We have to keep building resistance and relationships and resilience. We have to fill gaps and we have skilled and sustainable networks and cultivate critical mass so that we have the power and the infrastructure to win the changes that our community deserves. We have to defend the changes that we've made and the ground we've won. And we have to prepare to push for more. This is a long fight. It's the work of many lifetimes. We have a world to win and we aren't gonna win it tomorrow. But we can win it someday. We just have to keep showing up. I've been thinking a lot about sustainable advocacy and what the future of our movement looks like because I know that it's time for me to take a step back. As I shared last year, I developed long COVID in May of 2022. Like millions of other Americans, I'm facing the reality of a new disability, a lack of effective treatments and services, and an inability to continue working. I will be stepping down as executive director at the end of this year, and the ASAN board will conduct a search for a new executive director. More information about that process is gonna be available in the coming months. While that search takes place, my current deputy, Avery Outlaw, will serve as ASAN's interim executive director, and you'll hear from Avery in a little bit. I am confident in Avery's leadership, and I am so grateful that they agreed to step up, and we're working together to ensure a smooth transition. I want to reiterate what I said last year. This did not have to happen. I caught COVID for my support person who most likely caught it at his second job. Yes, his second job because my support person is essential to me having a good life, but the government doesn't think he deserves to be paid a living wage. And that's the case for millions of people with disabilities and our support people across the country. The direct support crisis is really a crisis about how much we as a country actually value disabled people, our dignity, and our inclusion. If we as a country valued people with disabilities, we would put our money where our mouth is. We would pay support workers living wages. We would ensure that this work is seen as the valued and necessary profession that it is. And we would ensure that every disabled person who needs support can get it and that everyone can live with dignity, safely in their community. Um, but we don't. Our elected leaders have made different choices. And those choices have had real, tangible effects on so many people. Those choices mean that my support person has to work two jobs. And then, you know, the federal government made another choice and decided to stop fighting the pandemic because it didn't pull well and the people who were dying were mostly people like me. And now I am stepping down as executive director of one of the few national disability-led disability rights organizations because our elected officials have demonstrated through their actions over and over again that they don't believe the health and well-being of people with disabilities matters. So, you know, this didn't have to happen. This was the result of deliberate policy choices and you know, more to the point, disability in action on the part of our elected officials. None of this had to happen, but it did. I wanna be absolutely clear. We do not have the tools to treat long COVID successfully right now. If you get sick, your whole life can change. Those odds go up every time you get COVID. And when you get sick, there is not going to be a safety net to catch you. You should know that if you have to stop working like I do, it will likely take you years to get on social security and you'll be very lucky to get it at all. Even if you're lucky enough to get benefits, you will be forced to live in poverty. If you are too tired to cook or to shower, good luck getting help. 
And none of this is new. People with many different disabilities have been living this reality for decades. This isn't a new struggle. We desperately need significantly more research focused on medical treatment for long COVID and similar conditions. But the holes that people with long COVID like me are falling through, you know, laughable public health policy, lack of paid leave, the utter inaccessibility of disability benefits, devastating underinvestment in services, the broken healthcare system, etc. These are not new problems. The fixes for those structural problems are not unique to long COVID. They're the same things the disability community has been fighting for already. And you know, all of that is cold comfort when it happens to you. So I'd appreciate it if the disability community would keep showing up on COVID. Treat the truth like it matters. Don't hold big unmasked events. Encourage people to get vaccinated. Think about how you can include immunocompromised and high-risk folks in your work and in your events. Recognize that long COVID will be devastating to many of our folks and that that risk goes up with every reinfection. Push for the structural changes, not just to address this crisis, but to prevent the next one. Hold our elected officials accountable for their utter abandonment of the disability community. Don't join them. This is a bittersweet transition for me. I am not stepping back because I want to, I'm stepping back because I have to. I love ASAN, I love the autistic community, and I love the broader self-advocacy movement that was created by people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. I've been doing this work since I was a teenager, <laughs> mentored by the self-advocates in my state who survived and closed my home state's major institution. I love this work and I go to bed every night thinking about how much more there is to be done. I also want to acknowledge that often the most crucial work being done is not the work that gets a lot of attention on social media. A lot of the people doing it aren't on social media at all. And I want to challenge those of us who are to take a moment and reflect on where we are spending our energy. Social media has been a vital organizing tool for the autistic community. For many of us, it enables us to connect and interact with other people in ways that we just can't do offline. Online activism will always be a powerful tool for the autistic community, and online autistic spaces help many people realize that we aren't alone, we aren't broken, and we can have a say in our own lives. Online autistic spaces saved my life, and I know that that is true for many others. Social media is also you know, a very reactive place with a thousand different ar arguments going on at once. That's just how it works for every community. Um, and in activist communities, and again, this is not just the autistic community, a lot of energy often gets focused on language. And that makes sense. You know, These mediums are often text-based and language matters. Language has incredible power to shape our world. But when those discussions become like the foremost discussions our community is having, we should occasionally take a step back and look at the bigger picture. So I think a lot about an exchange I saw on Twitter a few years ago, although you know I see a different version of it every week. Um, a parent said that her daughter loved the institution she had placed her in. And in the tweet, I think she referred to her daughter as like a person with autism. So she received dozens of replies chastising her for using person first language and she only received a couple of replies that were concerned about the fact that she had institutionalized her daughter and was wanted to make it easier for other families to do the same i want to suggest that the problem with person first language or functioning labels or other problematic language is usually not the words themselves it's what the words are used to do. When a parent of an autistic child talks about how their child with autism loves the institution they're in, the problem is not that they use person first language. It's that they're talking about institutionalizing their child. Um, yes, terms like profound autism are harmful. 
these terms are they're vague, poorly defined, they perpetuate dangerous stereotypes, and they don't actually tell us what the person needs help with. But the bigger problem is what the people wielding those terms are trying to use them to do. So let me be very clear. The people who are championing terms like profound autism want to institutionalize autistic people with higher support needs. They want to institutionalize non-speaking autistic people and autistic people with intellectual disabilities. They want to give institutions new names and fresh coats of paint and then open them back up to warehouse the autistic people that they deem too severe to live in the community. They want to deny any agency or autonomy to autistic people who have complex needs and instead just funnel them into guardianship, institutions, sheltered workshops, and a lifetime of ABA in segregated settings where they will never, ever have a chance to live an ordinary, self-determined life alongside everyone else. I know this because they say so. They say so in their organizational position statements on their websites, in the policies they champion and in the ones they oppose, in their interviews and in their op-eds, they want to legitimize the idea that there is a good autism and a bad autism. And then they want, you know, quote unquote, bad autism to mean that you are isolated and segregated and your life is controlled by other people. And when we ignore those explicit goals in favor of scolding about person first language, we help them. When we only use the language of neurodiversity to talk about people who need less support, we help them. When we seed the idea and agree that support must mean control and that services for autistic people with the greatest impairments must be more restrictive and segregated, we help them. And what we should be doing <laughs> with one loud, clear voice is saying no. We should be saying no. We will not let you institutionalize and abuse some of the most vulnerable members of our community. We will not let you divide autistic people into groups of people who you decide are either too severe to make their own choices or people who are too high functioning to need any support. We will not let you say that there is a good autism and a bad autism. We won't let you bastardize the term neurodiversity into a smoke screen for hurting the most vulnerable autistic people. We will not let you say that human rights are only for those of us who can walk or talk or test well or live by ourselves. And we can say all of that while also acknowledging that it is absolutely true that some autistic people have significant complex support needs and disabilities that are at times, you know, with the resources we often have right now, difficult to address. It's true that there are autistic people who will never live without 24 seven one-on-one -on -one support or more. It's true that there are autistic people in crisis who struggle with some really dangerous behaviors. It's true that there are non-speaking autistic people that we haven't yet found an easy or adequate way to communicate with yet. And it's true that our education and our health and our service systems often do not live up to their promises. And many of these people and their families are being utterly failed by what has been offered to them. But none of that changes what someone's human rights are. Inclusion is for everyone. Inclusion is a human right. Self-determination and autonomy are for everyone. Supported decision-making and control over your day and your own life are for everyone. Self-advocacy is for everyone, even if it looks like a behavior at first. Inclusion and belonging in that broader community are for everyone. Life on our own terms is for everyone. Neurodiversity is for everyone. Yes, there are autistic people who need intense support around the clock. Support should not mean segregation. Care should not mean control. No label, no diagnosis, no behavior, no support need changes this. The only criteria for human rights is being alive. 
And stuff like this is the reason the first self-advocacy groups were called People First. These are not ideas I made up. They have been painstakingly articulated for decades by people with intellectual disabilities, by institution survivors, and by people with complex disabilities who need 24-7 support. They have been borne out by decades of research and practice. Most people with these disabilities, including some autistic people, are still not given access to the supports they deserve and that are necessary in order to make these ideas real. But that doesn't mean it's impossible. That doesn't mean we give up. It means we need to fight harder. We have an obligation to those members of our community to not leave them behind. It is one of the most important obligations our movement has. So I want to challenge us to reflect on where we're putting our energy. I want to challenge us to draw closer to the core of our movement. And if you haven't already, I want to challenge you to build real relationships with self-advocates with intellectual disabilities. They're not always online, and they don't always use the same jargon that you might be familiar with. But they exist, and they are doing powerful work. They have been for a long time. So go to a People First meeting, or a meeting of your local SAVE chapter, or another you know, meeting or gathering for people with intellectual disabilities in your area. Listen to what they have to say. Be in community with the people there. Build relationships. Learn from the people without whom there wouldn't be a self-advocacy movement at all. Learn from the people who lived in state institutions and learn from the people who still live in group homes and work in sheltered workshops. Learn from the people who escaped lives like that and fought to make sure that you could too. Practice allyship. Figure out how to include them and center them in your individual advocacy and how to support theirs. Become co-conspirators. You will be better off for it, and so will our movement. And the future of our movement is strong. I want us to be stronger. We are in a turbulent, <laughs> changing, challenging time like everybody else. But I know that we can navigate these rocky waters, and I know that we can stay true to our North Star. Already, I take great comfort and joy in the fact that our movement is tangibly stronger than it was when I was a teenager. As executive director, I have met countless self-advocates doing incredible work to build a better world for our community, training healthcare providers, fighting to end some minimum wage in their state, supporting AAC users, creating resources for families, <laughs> defending gender-affirming care for trans autistic people, protesting restraint and seclusion, creating local peer support networks and mutual aid, running for office, leading transformative research, preserving our history, <laughs> cultivating autistic culture, building deep partnerships across movements, and so much more. I know our community will keep showing up for the next generation of autistic kids. And I know that ASAN will keep doing everything we can to equip our community with the tools that we need for systemic advocacy and powerful change. Over the past year, as I've navigated medical leave, ASAN's incredible staff have kept us running. We fought back against attacks on trans autistic people. We've released several new resources and started drafting even more. We've trained people who use community living services on their rights. We've continued the fight to stop the shock. We've weighed in on critical regulations and federal policy developments. And we held a major symposium with autistic people, researchers, and autistic researchers to discuss a research agenda that reflects our community's actual needs. I am confident that ASAN will continue to thrive in my absence because we've already shown that we can. There has also been so much discussion of our political leaders and disability this year. All of it bad. And I just need to say that regardless of how you feel about a given politician weaponizing disability to argue that people who use mobility aids or people who have cognitive disabilities cannot lead is wrong. It is possible to condemn a politician's actions or inactions without relying on ableism. It really is. And yet here we are. So I want to be clear that disability and leadership are not incompatible and that just as elected officials 
often have dozens of staffers buzzing around them, making sure that they're wearing the right blazer and they're on schedule and they've been briefed for their next meeting. So too do many self-advocates rely on elaborate scaffoldings of support you might not see in order to do their advocacy. I want young self-advocates to know that it is possible to be disabled and to still do this work. It's possible to be disabled, to need help, and even to need a lot more help than me, and to still be a leader. It takes a lot of work, yes, and a lot of time to get good at it, but it is possible. I've done this. I don't have a college degree or any formal education in policy. That has been an asset. I have learned so much more from working with other self-advocates and people who are in the trenches doing this work than I ever could have on a campus. So I want to make it really clear, the qualifications for doing this work don't have to do with letters after your name or certificates and diplomas on your wall. The qualifications for doing this work are showing up, being ready to learn from others, doing your best and learning how to mess up. Because you will mess up, we all will, but you try again and you learn and you do better. As Laura Hershey famously said, you get proud by practicing. And finally, I want to see self-advocates who have more significant and obvious support needs than I do in positions of leadership like this. People like Jordan Zimmerman, Samuel Habib, and Hari Sunervasan are paving the way and they're following the tracks laid by Bob Williams, Mel Baggs, and Lois Curtis. I want to see self-advocates who rely on AAC, who need information in plain language, who have support people with them at work, and who are obviously significantly disabled lead the way. I want to see them in real leadership roles with the support they need to thrive, to be taken seriously, and to make real change. Because if we only ever focus on promoting self-advocates who are more comfortable for non-disabled people to be around, we're never going to make real change. So I want to challenge my colleagues without disabilities too. It will take tackling structural and attitudinal ba barriers head on to make sure that people with the most significant disabilities are leaders too. It's up to you. It will require doing things differently, taking more time, and breathing through discomfort. You're going to need to examine assumptions you didn't even know you had about what a leader is and how they look and move and sound. You'll need to change conversational norms in the way you run meetings. You'll need to build more space into schedules. You'll need to allocate resources differently, rethink priorities, and challenge your friends. But you did those things for me. And I'm telling you, there is a whole world of leaders out there who will absolutely blow you away if you make room for them. I've been the executive director at ASAN for seven years now. The first thing I learned about being in any visible leadership position is that you don't do it alone. You rely on it on your team every day, all day. <laughs> the face of a team has a team behind them and thank God for that. I have had an amazing team behind me every step of the way and I want to end by thanking all of them now. So first, Thank you to the current ASAN team, AJ, Alex, Avery, Dean and Donnie, Eli, Greg, Iante, Jean, Jules, Catherine, Larkin, Mar, Noor, Reed, and Zoe. Thank you to everyone who has worked at ASAN in the past. There are too many of you to list here, but I appreciate every single one of you. And thank you to our founder, Ari, who brought ASAN into being at great personal sacrifice and made sure that all means all was written into our DNA. On a more personal note, I also want to thank, I also want to say thank you to my support person, Colton, and to the circle of people who have been on team Keep Julia Alive. Thank you to the colleagues who showed me how to lobby, write legislation, and take up space confidently, or at least look confident, in the halls of power. Thank you to my mentors for making this work a little less lonely and a lot more possible. Thank you to our many coalition and research partners whose work strengthens our own. Thank you to everyone who ever noticed that self-advocate voices were missing and invited us to the table. 
Thank you to our funders and our donors who provide us with the resources we need to keep doing this work. And thank you to everyone who's ever participated in one of our different events, ACI, the Day of Mourning, our protests, webinars, the gala, all our other events. Your commitment and work and energy sustains ASAN and makes us a better organization. We often say at ASAN that when we were first founded, people were shocked if a single self-advocate walked into the room. Now, policymakers and those in power may not want us there, but they've learned to expect that we're going to show up anyway. We are slowly but surely approaching critical mass, rocking and flapping our way towards the day when all policy impacting autistic people is led first and foremost by autistic people ourselves. This work is so much bigger than any one person. It has been an honor to be a small part of this movement. I cannot wait to see what our community does next. Thank you all. It has been so wonderful to work with you and for you. I'll see you around. We will now start our 2023 Gala Award Ceremony. This year, we have more awardees than ever before. We used to have just one award for self-advocacy, one award for nonfiction, and one award for an outstanding ally. This year, we have nine awardees in six different categories. We'll be starting with the Nothing About Us Without Us Award. This award is given to autistic self-advocates whose work fights to make sure that our community's voices are being heard everywhere, that decisions impacting our lives are being made. We have three awardees in this category this year. We're happy to give one of our Nothing About Us Without Us awards to Joyner Emmerich for their continuous work towards equitable education for students, particularly disabled students and students of color, and an educational system that does not value or make space for them. We are thrilled to give this award to them. We're proud to give the next Nothing About Us Without Us award to Monique Botha, for their continued work around the state of autism research and researchers. In addition to their research on the dehumanization, objectification, and stigmatization of autistic people in autism research, Monique also spoke at ASAN and the Policy and Analytics Center's Autism Research for Us Symposium in September. We are honored to give them this award. And last but not least, we are incredibly grateful to give our final Nothing About Us Without Us award to Noreen Hunani, RD, for her work around nutrition and disordered eating for neurodivergent people and your neurodivergent affirming education for dietitians and professionals. Her work, both personally and through the founding of RDs for Neurodiversity, fills a huge gap in the need for trauma-informed neurodiversity, affirming nutrition and health care. It is incredibly meaningful to have autistic people who are changing the cultural norms and scripts we have around people dealing with eating disorders and advocating for changes to make it more possible for neurodivergent people to exist as both providers and patients. We are honored to present you with this award. Next up is our Creating Community Together Award. This award recognizes autistic people who are working to grow and strengthen communities in various ways. We're excited to give the first of two Creating Community Together awards this year to Project Let's in recognition of their continued work to build peer support collectives and community-based care. Next, we're happy to award our second Creating Community Together award to the European Council of Autistic People for its continued work for autistic people and in particular this, their work this year to create the Global Autistic Task Force on Autism Research or GATFAR. GAFAR was formed as a reaction to the publication of the Lancet Commission on the Future of Care and Clinical Research in Autism. As a response to the Lancet Commission paper, GAFAR members authored an open letter and an article. GAFAR includes members in parts of North America, South America, Europe, Asia, Australia, and Oceania, and provides a model to inspire future research to amplify autistic voices and give us meaningful roles in discourse on autism research. Thank you, UCAP. We're excited to announce this year's Mel Bags Down in the Valley Award. In loving memory of Mel Bags, this award is given to people that we feel are doing work that honors Mel's legacy and the advocacies he did for autistic people. 
The name of the award comes from one of Mel's writings called Up in the Clouds and Down in the Valley, My Richness and Yours, which includes the line, they have lived on a mountain so long, they've forgotten the valley I come from even exists. This year, the Mel Bags Down in the Valley Award goes to Ira Idol for their work to create the Autistic Archive, a project to document 30 years of our community's history. According to Ira, they created the archive in response to a need for better preservation of information related to the autistic community and neurodiversity movement's history. Thank you for your work, Ira, and we're excited to present this award. The Loud Hands Award for Autistic Storytellers seeks to honor autistic people who are telling stories, whether fiction or nonfiction, that are making change. This year's Loud Hands Award goes to A Day With No Words, written by Tiffany Hammond and illustrated by Kate Cosgrove. A Day With No Words is an incredible piece of work and it's always exciting to see more representation for non-speaking autistic people that feels authentic rather than dehumanizing. Thank you for your remarkable work. We are honored to present you this award. The Harry McBride Johnson Award, one of the oldest awards we've given, is named for a disabled author, attorney, and disability rights activist. Her writings on her own life and the disability rights movement embody the spirit of this award. This year, we are incredibly happy to award Alice Wong the Harriet McBride Johnson Award for nonfiction for her book, Year of the Tiger, an ongoing work on the Disability Visibility Project. Alice's work has continued to showcase the voices of disabled folks, including her own, and we are thrilled to present this award to her this year. ASAN's award for ally to the autistic community is given to people who support the autistic community, but also understand the importance of listening to and connecting with autistic people and ensuring that autistic people are part of both the conversation and the fight. The award for 2022 is given to Kristen Batima Patel for her research into the ethics of ABA research. As an organization and a community, we have made our stance on ABA clear, but this research is vital to demonstrate what we as a community have said for many years. Hello everyone, I'm Avery Outlaw and I'll be the Interim Executive Director here at ASAN. Thanks to all of you for joining us for this year's gala. I want to start with another round of congratulations to all of our awardees from this year. We are giving more awards this year than ever before, again, uh, which is truly a testament to the hard work and dedication of our awardees and our community. Autistic people are making ourselves heard in school boards, in research, and in so many other fields. We're building our own communities, we're recording our history, and we're building on the work that so many activists have done to improve the lives of autistic people across the world, to, truly, to ensure that there truly is nothing about us without us. While the gala is a time for celebration, it's also our last gala with Julia as executive director. I think I speak for all the staff when I say, thank you, Julia. I want to emphasize from the bottom of my heart how grateful we are here at ASAN to have had your leadership. Over the past seven years, ASAN has more than doubled our staff, more than doubled our budget, and much more than doubled the amount of work that we take on. It is because of your work and guidance that I know ASAN is much stronger now than we've ever been before, and I'm confident that we're going to continue growing stronger. In the next months, ASAN's board of directors will handle the search and hiring process for the next executive director. While that is ongoing, ASAN will continue our work advocating for change and creating resources for our community. Some of our priorities for the next year include uh, the development of a research agenda based on what autistic people need, not what uh, parents or researchers assume. We've done a lot of work on making sure autistic people have seats at the table when it comes to autism research priorities and funding. We partnered with the Policy Impact Project to hold a symposium earlier this year bringing together autistic self-advocates, autistic autism researchers, and non-autistic autism researchers. This symposium will result in a research agenda that we can use to advocate for research that reflects our priorities and centers autistic people's participation and leadership. Next, the end of the 14C program. It is decades past time to end the discriminatory practice of paying people with disabilities less than minimum wage. We will continue to engage with the Department of Labor's review of that program and demand that they end it. We'll also keep pushing for the pa passage of the Transformation to Competitive Integrated Employment Acts, which would both end subminimum wage and provide resources to promote competitive integrated employment. We continue to see process on that front. 15 states have now banned subminimum wage, and three additional states have no existing 14C certificates. Self-advocates are working tirelessly to ban subminimum wage across the U.S. The number of people being paid less than minimum wage has dropped dramatically from 300,000 in 2010 to the current numbers of around 45,000. While we are heartened to see that that decrease, it is not enough. We will not rest until no one is being paid less than minimum wage. It is also far past time to stop the shock. 
we will not stop until no one is subject to electric shock torture. We will not stop until no one is institutionalized. Every single disabled person deserves a life in the community where they are not subject to abuse and torture. We need to fight to close the remaining institutions, to prevent new institutions from being built, and to ensure that every disabled person has the supports and services that they need to live and thrive in their community. To that end, we'll continue to work to pass legislation that meets our community's needs and keep resisting cuts and advocating for increased funding to crucial social service programs like Medicaid, HCBS, and SNAP. ASAN will also work in coalition with other disability and civil rights organizations to address systemic issues and multiple axes of oppression in our society. In the past two years, we've noticed repeated threats to reproductive rights and LGBTQ rights. The impacts of structural racism continue to have devastating impacts on people and communities of color, from police violence to housing to health care. ASAN will not only continue to take action against these harmful policies, but also provide resources to assist self-advocates to take action. In the next year and beyond, we'll continue to address these issues together. To echo Julia, we'll keep showing up. We'll defend the changes that we've made and we'll push for more. We'll ensure that self-advocates are heard in the halls of power on every issue that concerns us. And we know that our community, all of you, will keep showing up with us. To everyone who has called their legislators in response to one of our action alerts, or written a public comment, or showed up to tell the Department of Labor to end subminimum wage, thank you. It is absolutely crucial that the government hear from you, loudly and repeatedly, on the issues that affect disabled folks. Since last year, our community has flooded the Interagency Autism Coordinating Committee for each meeting with pages of public comments letting them know what self-advocates think about autism research. We've successfully rebuffed efforts to drastically cut funding to programs that, that provide necessary services to members of our, of our community. Just this week, we commented on updated 504 regulations that provide critical anti-discrimination protections for people with disabilities in healthcare settings. ASAN will continue to develop resources to help everyone advocate. In the coming year, we only have bigger and greater ideas to make sure our community has the tools and information to make our voices heard. That means plain language webinars on policy issues, easy read resources on running a self-advocacy group, information on voting accessibility to help ensure people with disabilities can vote, and much more. ASAN will continue to grow and support our community, just as you have supported us. I'd like to say again, thank you. Thank you to our organizational partners and allies. Thank you to our community. Thank you to Julia. Thank you to ASAN staff, all of whom have taken on additional responsibilities throughout this transition. I want to now pass the proverbial mic to our staff to hear about just a few of the incredible things they've worked on throughout the year and the progress they're looking to make in the year to come. Thank you. Hi, I'm Johnny Dunham, and I'm ASAN's Inclusive Publications and Research Coordinator. My favorite project we worked on this year is our two new resources for the Pratt and Supported Project. This year, ASAN created two sets of easy read and plain language resources for Pratt and Supported. I am proud of these resources because they will help LGBTQ plus people without any self-advocate for their rights around being LGBTQ plus and being in romantic and sexual relationships. Thank you. Hi there, my name is Noor Pravas. I am the Community Engagement Manager over at ASAN. I am excited about our continued work on LGBTQ plus issues and the ways that they intersect with the disability community. Disability rights and trans rights very much intersect and there are LGBTQ plus disabled people everywhere that deserve our rights and our protection. Hi all, I'm Alex Grandstaff, ASAN's program manager. And this year I was really happy to co-facilitate our HCBS settings rule training with our inclusive publications and research coordinator, Donnie. Um, it was really great to be able to help people know exactly what the HCBS settings rule means for folks. And so they'll be able to help make sure folks in their communities know their rights. In the upcoming year, I'm looking forward to us continuing to produce new resources that are accessible to more people. 
as we add more types of yarn, the stories we weave together can become as diverse and as beautiful as our communities. Hi, my name is Jules Good. I use they, them pronouns, and I am the programs coordinator at the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network as of this October. Um, this upcoming year, I'm really excited to work on growing and deepening our grassroots advocacy efforts um, so that we can weave together all of the amazing work that self-advocates are doing across the country. My name is Reed Kaplan, and I'm the Accessible Policy Coordinator at ASAN. One thing I'm proud of at ASAN this year is the trainings we gave on writing in plain language and easy read. Writing for cognitive accessibility, meaning in ways that people can easily understand, is one way to find common threads between all of us. I hope you'll look forward to our plain language and easy read resources and trainings next year. Hi, I'm Dean Strauss and I'm ASAN's communications manager. One of my favorite things this year was our Autism Campus Inclusion Leadership Academy. ACI helps autistic students learn how to make their colleges better for disabled folks and really develop their advocacy skills. Part of advocating for our rights and our futures is making sure that the next generation of advocates have the skills and resources they need, and I'm so glad that ACI can be a part of that. I'm so excited for next ACI in 2024 and to meet our next cohort.